encourage you to turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 20. We're going to wrap up this series, uh, these gos- uh, the, excuse me, the parables in Luke's gospel, uh, Luke chapter 20 this morning. And we know Jesus is making his way, he's now made his way to Jerusalem for the final time and the religious leaders who are not all that happy with what Jesus has been sharing and demonstrating, uh, they are certainly hot on his heels here and uh, he has shown himself to be one with authority. The things he says, the things that he does, he went into the temple just before what we're going to read here and he drives those who are... uh, there for very strategic business uh, in the temple. He drives them out of, of God's house. But that doesn't keep Jesus away. Um, he goes right back there and he starts teaching the people. And of course, the, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, um, they're all beside themselves at this point, trying anything they can do to keep Jesus quiet, to silence him, if not get rid of him altogether. And so they ask Jesus a question very bluntly in Luke chapter 20. It's a question that Jesus doesn't answer directly. Jesus rarely answers questions directly. He knows the heart. He knows the motivation behind what it is they're trying to do. But he is going to answer this question in the parable that, uh, that we're going to read. So this is found in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. I think it really captures the, the mission of Jesus. Um, pictures his rejection. Pictures his death uh, and his judgment at his return. So... Uh, Last week, you may remember, the parable focused on justification. Now we're going to move with a a shift to to judgment before a merciful uh, God. Beginning at verse 9. And he began to tell the parable, excuse me, he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant that they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, Oh, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The grass withers, the flower fades, but it is this word of our God that endures forever. Would you pray with me? Lord God, as we turn our attention to your word this morning, we ask for your help. We ask, Lord, that we would be those who handle your word rightly that we would be attentive and submissive to the word that you give to us, to its instruction, to its encouragement, to its warning. Uh, Lord, move in our hearts, we pray, through this, your living word. We offer this in Jesus' name, amen. There's a fun little children's book. It's called The Burglar Next Door. I remember uh, reading this from the kids when they were much younger than they are now. Uh, But the house next door was very dark and scary looking. And uh, Jennifer took her flashlight and she peered through the window and she was flashing her light uh, to this house next door and another light peered back at her. And it frightened her. And so she ran to her brother's room and said, there's, there's someone in the house next door. And they crept upstairs and she shone her light again and the light returned right on her. And so in their terror and fright, they talk to the parents and they call the police. The police come rushing over to the house and, and go inside the house uh, next, door, next door to check things out. And then the officers come out and they have smiles on their faces. And they say, why don't, why don't you come inside and see your burglar? And so they go to the, the second story there. And right in the middle of a room is a mirror placed just right to reflect Jennifer's flashlight right back 
at her. Uh, she was the one in the house. She was actually the, uh, the burglar after all, as the story ends. And as Jesus begins to share this parable about a vineyard and the owner of this vineyard, it did not take the people long who are listening to figure out that they're in the story. That Jesus is actually talking about them. He's holding up a mirror for them to see their own actions before God. And as soon as Jesus starts talking about a vineyard, they are thinking about, this is the people of Israel. And we learn this from places like Isaiah 5, where God's, uh, God's people, His chosen covenant people, are His vineyard. They're the privileged heirs of God's kingdom. And as His vineyard, He's the one that, that cares for them and protects them, provides, gives them all the uh, provision to be a blessing to those around them. But then how do they respond? Isaiah 5 tells us that they reject uh, this gift. And they're without excuse and, and uh, bring judgment upon themselves. And so the, the focus of the prophet in Isaiah 5 is more on the, the fruit of the vineyard. When Matthew shares this parallel uh, parable, he's drawing out the importance of the fruit. But Luke's attention is on the owner of this vineyard, the authority that the owner has over it. Uh, so by Jesus holding up this mirror to those who are asking about his authority, he is showing them the authority that they live under, the authority that they are accountable to. Um, so as we're listening to this parable, considering what Jesus is showing his audience, we, we need to look in the mirror, right? Um, what is God showing us about ourselves through this story? What is he saying about himself and the judgment uh, to come? We'll touch on each of those uh, questions. Um, what is God showing us? The owner of the vineyard here, he's the, he's the one who planted it. He goes on a journey and he uh, places it in the care of these tenants. And in this time, tenant farmers would be ones who lived on the property. They would see that, um, that the, the vineyard, the crop is, is taken in and it's, it's producing. And so already we're seeing a kindness on the part of the owner by allowing this. He's allowing tenants to work his vineyard. So he's actually supplying for their needs. They would enjoy the fruit of the vineyard while living there, um, giving them the privilege of caring for it. So let's not underestimate the privilege that that is right out of the gate. To work the land each day. To go about the God-given purpose and work that he's uh, entrusted to us. It may be in the fields, it could be in our homes, it could be in the office, it could be at school. Um, we've been made to tend and harvest what belongs to the owner. Um, that's what the tenants are doing here. So the owner sends back a servant, someone who can represent him just to collect some of the fruit. All the fruit belongs to this owner already, but he simply is going to retrieve uh, some of it and, and enjoy that. And here's where the real hearts of these tenants uh, come out. They've been put in this, in this position to care, a very privileged position. They have a great responsibility, but rather than responding with gratitude, responding in appreciation to the owner, they, they despise this responsibility. They despise even the owner. So they're thinking, you know, you can't have what is rightfully yours. You're gone now and it's ours and we're going to fight for it. Think of a parent or, or a grandparent, you know, you, you give your, your young child something to play with and you have to do it quickly, you know, spur of the moment. It could be the keys, it could be a headband, it could be something like that just to keep them occupied, you know. Well, is it all that easy to get that thing back? No, they're usually, no, this is mine now, right? Even though you're the one who owns it and bought it and, and gave it to them for the moment. So we see this sort of childlike greed and selfishness in these tenants, almost a blindness, presuming that they can keep what is not theirs by force. They can call the shots and, and have this all themselves. So don't, don't turn away from this mirror too quickly. Jesus is he's showing us our own sin-scarred hearts, stony hearts of men. Um, the tenants are just abusing the privilege that was theirs. We see how the leaders of Israel have a history of lording over the people, using them to their own advantage. 
and even the people themselves, the people of Israel, casting aside the law of God. And so we, we, do know that we, we do this no less as individuals, as a church, maybe ignoring, taking for granted what has been entrusted to us. And do we consider the great privilege it is, even now, to center the preached word of God every week? To have access to the Bible, the very words of life, any time that we want. And maybe you were raised in a Christian home or by Christian parents or grandparents. Consider what a privilege that is. Think of the resources that has been entrusted to this land. Not just physical resources, but spiritual resources. The ability, the materials, the training, the availability of worship. I mean, that's unmatched anywhere in this world. And we tend to squander that. We move farther and farther away from what, um, what God's purpose and law is for us. And we gaze upon the holiness of God when we see what is good and right and true. When the owner makes his claim for what is his in our lives, we can put up our hand because of all of what's been entrusted to us. We put up our hand and say, no, not here. Not now. Maybe even get out. I don't want you. I don't need you. I am Lord of this realm. I mean, that's what we're doing in our sin. Say we we want none of what the owner uh, is entrusted, entitled to. Um, I think this is the undercurrent of pluralism, why it's so popular uh, in our culture. You You believe what it is you want to believe. Whatever it is you think will get you to where it is you are going, I'll believe what I want to believe because we're all going to kind of end up in the same place anyway. Um, and if that is true, then, then we're accountable to ourselves, to, to this authority, to this Lord. I mean, this, is, this is true right where we live. That this God complex of individual autonomy, it's dominant everywhere. Take a look in the mirror. Is that entrenched even in our own hearts? We can certainly be grateful for the freedom to, to believe certain things, to, to practice behavior that stems from that belief. But, but if the lordship stays here with the individual, then it's going to meet the same end as these tenants when the owner returns. So when we, when we abuse what, what's been entrusted by God, um, say not here, not here, Lord. It could be happening in our homes in our vehicles, in the classroom, coffee shop, wherever. Um, that is when the owner, he'll return and he will say, okay, if that is your desire, um, if that is the way that you really want it, and church family, this is, this is the way that ends in hell forever. The inhabitants of hell receive only what it is they desire and have wanted an existence apart from the grace and mercy and kindness of the owner. And it just, I get goosebumps even thinking about that the majority of people that we know and see every day are moving in this direction and they're doing so quite comfortably under the guise of freedom or my rights. Dare I ask the question, are you in that place? You actually believe that you belong to yourself. That, this, that all the stuff belongs to you. Are there those places in your life that the owner has no right to? It will somehow escape from giving account for every thought, every word, every abuse of responsibility or privilege. No, no we will not. And so we've been entrusted with uh, the kingdom of God, the very message of the gospel, what a, the greatest privilege of all to be entrusted uh, with this. You know, you, you hit the lottery or someone hands you a billion dollars as you walk out of church uh, this morning. It doesn't begin to touch the privilege of sitting where it is we are sitting under the preached word of the living God. Um, so with this mirror, we, we see ourselves Jesus is also showing us more about himself. 
See, the owner sends his servants. The prophets of old were, were sent to the people of Israel. They were ignored. They were abused. They were killed. If you recall the days of Elijah, when Jezebel was on a rampage, just uh, killing the prophets of the Lord, uh, people stoned Zechariah during the reign of King Joash. And according to Jewish tradition, at least, Isaiah the prophet was uh, sawn in half um, under the order of Manasseh. And so we've, as we look at Hebrews 11, you know, it tells us the, the, the fate of so many faithful uh, witnesses to the Jews who were rejected and destroyed. And so the Lord is still sending His servants today with this prophetic message. We still see them rejected, kicked right out the front door, or worse. So the owner sends his beloved son. His own blood and the tenants destroy him. We're not sure how the property would have transferred to the tenants, but if the landlord is gone and the heir dies, then this situation would have resulted in that type of arrangement. But in Luke 3, we hear God the Father, the owner of the vineyard, uh, speak at the baptism of Jesus. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus speaks of himself, the death that he would face. And so the tenants, the representatives of Israel here, they've rejected him and his authority. Jesus came to proclaim the gospel. He came to show them the very kingdom of God, healing, teaching them, teaching them where that That true inheritance is found, and the Jews kill him. John chapter 1, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So these tenants, the Jews, reject the stone as useless. But this stone, Jesus, was destined to become a cornerstone. The stone in which the whole building is built off of. So even though the Jews reject him, he's not going to stay rejected or cast aside. He will be the source and the foundation of uh, the new structure for new owners of the vineyard. And so as we get to Acts, Luke part 2, we see this transfer of authority from the original tenants uh, to the son and to others. Listen to Acts 13. This is Paul and Barnabas. Paul speaks boldly, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Again, Acts 18. And when they opposed and reviled him, this is Paul speaking to Jews in Corinth, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. New ownership. New tenants, both Jew and Gentile. True sons and daughters of Abraham will inherit the vineyard and all the blessings that come with that ownership. So Jesus is the cornerstone, the very foundation and head of the church. He can't just be cast aside. The new house, the new temple of God is being built up in Christ. We get to Isaiah chapter 8 tells us that he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. So Jesus, the one who builds his church, he's going to be a sanctuary. Is that sanctuary for those who rest in him? But it'll be a stumbling stone crushing those who, who turn from him. It's the stone in the prophet Daniel. He interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Here's what Daniel said. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Um, A stone fashioned only by the God of heaven will crush the kingdoms of the earth. Those who reject Christ, who reject the authority of God, will be cried. That moves us into this, this last point here. What does it tell us about um, judgment? We see ourselves, we see the mission of Jesus and his death, the death that he would face. We need to consider the warning of judgment. Um, you know, as I read a parable like this, and maybe you hear it as well. 
and think this, you know, what is the owner doing here? What, what is he really doing? He's sending his servants and they're beating them. He sends one, they beat him. He sends another and they beat him. He doesn't have to keep sending servants. Why does he keep doing this? I mean, this is, it's time to wipe these folks out. You know, this is B2s on target, send in the SWAT team, whatever. Get rid of them. He doesn't have to stand for this. It's his vineyard. It's his generosity that they're there to begin with. So this parable tells us anything. It tells us just how patient and merciful the owner is. I mean, these tenants who think that they're in charge only serve to amplify his mercy. How patient our God is with those who reject him. How patient he is with me who turns from him day in and day out. I mean, the fact that we're sitting here this morning, you know, rehearsing for heaven and the rock of offense, the stone of stumbling, the king of kings and lord of lords has not come with the sword, that magnifies his mercy. Now is the day of his patience. Now is the day of his favor. Let's not presume upon this. Don't mistake God's patience with indifference. He cannot tolerate sin. Every justice will be righted. Praise God for this. But his patience is not limitless. Jesus poses the very question in verse 15. You tell me. You give the judgment. What's the response for such wicked behavior? And Matthew provides uh, the answer. Luke sort of glosses in verse 16. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. They, they knew it. They're hearing their, of their own destruction. And the Jews could see this fulfilled in part with the destruction of Jerusalem. But even with the destruction of Jerusalem, it didn't mean you know, all of Israel was, was destroyed. It doesn't mean that all the tenants, all Jews will not be part of that vineyard. Still Jews among the true Israel of God. But in God's patience, we must remember that He carries the sword and that that time is coming. That all who, the return of Christ, um, just as man is destined to die once, after that to face judgment, Hebrews tells us, the God who offers salvation now is the God who will judge in righteousness at the time of death. So we need to hear this warning. We need to, to look to Christ, the stone being rejected by the Jews. And Jesus stares right at them when he gives them this answer in verse 17. So with all seriousness, and yes, I'm hesitant to because of my own fear of man, um, there are likely those who are sitting here this morning, maybe watching sometime later, you're going to get up after the service, you're going to smile, you're going to shake your hands, you're going to go out that door and there'll be no tinge of conscience, no real consideration of your heart before God because you're assuming that life is just going to go on and because you've maybe been baptized someday, because you have some record in the church that things are just going to work out all right. Um, the kingdom of God has been preached to you. Don't miss this. Don't let it go. Don't wait. Kiss the son lest he be angry because when that stone falls, it will crush you in perfect righteousness. But, for those with the ears to hear, and a willingness to be honest before God, the stone does not crush. It's not a stumbling block. It is the foundation of a new sanctuary. By faith, it is your sanctuary. It is my sanctuary. It's marvelous in our eyes. And the owner of the vineyard, he has come to our rescue. The stone that, he has given the stone rejected by men, but chosen and precious in his sight. All who would believe would be acceptable and brought near. Restored, built up for the glory of God. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So maybe you're listening this morning and say, well, yeah, I haven't rejected. I've accepted. I won't be crushed by the stone. It's, it's my sanctuary. What, what is the ongoing evidence in your life that that is true? Are you going deeper in your love for Christ? Are you feasting on the words of life? Is there a passion to know Him more? 
that goes beyond just an hour on Sunday morning? Are your conversations, your reflections throughout the day, throughout the week, are they animated by the Spirit of God? Are you living in repentant faith in the holiness of our Creator? Today is the day of His patience and mercy. And if He tarries until tomorrow, church family, then we can rejoice because we have one more day to fall more in love. We have one more day to know our Savior all the more. Charlie was just a little boy. Uh, his mother died when he was young. I know it sounds like a start of a Disney show, but it's not. It's a, uh, and his dad was doing the best that he can to, to raise him. His dad wanted to take him on a picnic. He'd never been on a picnic before. And so they, they made plans where they were going to go, and they, they put the food all together. They put everything in the car. He was so excited. And so when they went to bed, Charlie just could not sleep. So he got up and he ran to his daddy's room and he shook him and he, Charlie, Charlie, what's the matter? What's going on? Well, Daddy, I'm so excited about tomorrow. His dad said, well, I know you're excited. It's, it's going to be a great day, but it won't be as great if we don't get some sleep. So go back to bed. And so Charlie trudged down the hall and got back into his bed, but it didn't work. He couldn't sleep. And so he ran back to his daddy's room. He started pushing him. His daddy slowly opens his eyes and he's kind of ready to lay into Charlie because it's time to go to sleep. But he sees his face. And he says, Charlie, what's, the, what's wrong? And Charlie looks his dad in the eyes and he says, Daddy, I just want to thank you for tomorrow. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for today because the stone our Savior was uh, rejected and we can thank you for tomorrow and each day of your mercy and your grace. We pray, Lord, that you would build us up as your people, build us up in love as living stones in the sanctuary of you, our God. Move us by your Holy Spirit. Motivate us, in Christ, to, to throw off the sin that so easily entangles and to run this this race of grace with joy because you have prepared it for us, because you go before us. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.